The writing of any work of art, I suppose, is a gamble. You think you know what you've done and the value of the potential value of it, but you never can be sure until it's really tested before an audience. Never have we had a composer of his superb lyric and symphonic quality who has been personally so admired, respected, and let's say it, loved by so many people as has Aaron Copeland. I am not going to wish you a happy birthday because you're on the sunny side of 80, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> We're going to uh, talk a little bit about composing. Why, instead of being a pianist, which you did very well indeed, and conducting, which you have been doing recently, did you decide you wanted to be a conductor and that was what was the most important thing to you? Well, I found myself uh, at the piano in, at home, uh, picking out little tunes. I suppose it all began like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, once you get sufficiently uh, fascinated by the idea of finding little tunes for yourself, you want to know what to do with them. So you decide you need a teacher. And um, when I asked my father to uh, get me a teacher, he said, oh, I've spent so much money on the other four kids and their music lessons, and nothing came of it. I don't want to waste any more money. But I gradually convinced him that this was different, <laughs> so he paid for the lessons. But still, why a composer to you? What, what did it give you through all of those years, particularly to, to be writing music? What did it mean to you? Well, it, it's, um, I suppose, primarily, it's a way of finding something, uh, some way of um, imposing your personality, uh, you, what you think, feel, and mean to say um, to the rest of the world. And if you're born with a musical gift, as I suppose any composer would be, or they wouldn't be composing, um, you feel very lucky indeed, because that's a, a medium for the expression of personality, such as rarely exist in the world. It isn't like writing a book, uh, it isn't that precise, but it also has implications which are wider, I would think, than a mere uh, literary page. And uh, since the primary meaning of it is not that exact, everybody reads their own feelings into a piece of music, that made it seem very important to do, for me at any rate. And um, I gradually convinced my father that that was what I was going to do. I was the youngest of five, you see, and he was in a mood to accept what the youngest wanted to do. Okay. <laughs> I'm sure if I were the oldest, he would have been dead set against it. Well, I know that you had a brother who was a, um, uh, a lawyer. Yes. And uh, they, just didn't, they just didn't bother you so much. No, the, 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 I would have been a, had to be a doctor or something right. serious, not a, not a composer. There, w there was quite a distance between you and the last uh, child, in any case. You were the baby. In I was, yes. You? I was about six years uh, younger than my next older sister. Mm -hmm. Composing to you um, was something that you began very when you were about 15 or 16. And then, um, after a while, did you think that you wanted to be a concert pianist along with that? or? Was that never part of what you, you had considered? I suppose in the very early years I had a vague idea that I'd like to give concerts at the piano, but um, I never really um, enjoyed practicing enough to want to stick at it long enough to be, really develop a first-class virtuoso technique, so that uh, gradually all my interest went into the writing of music. You often uh, said uh, to me and to other people that um, when they, when they try to divide your life and your music up into periods and into styles, you have been very particular about the fact that uh, you always started, no matter whether it was a commission or whether it was a ballet or a film, with musical ideas. That, 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 that the music always came from essentially musical ideas. Mm -hmm. How would you, where did they come from? 
Heaven only knows. I have the slightest idea where they kind of came from or come from. Um, it comes from an inner need, I suppose. You have this uh, interest in music, and you find yourself picking out little tunes at the piano, and then wondering what harmonies go with them, and then you find a teacher to show you uh, the beginnings of musical uh, science, if you want to call Is it that. Is there such a thing called inspiration, though? Yes, but you're not very concerned about inspiration at the beginning. You're concerned mm -hmm. at getting a sufficient technique so that you can make sense out of a piece of music from beginning to end. Mm -hmm. Is there something mysterious about, uh, most people think, whoa, a, com a composer. They, that's, that has a mysterious uh, aspect to it. They really don't know what composers do. They're kind of a strange breed <laughs> to most people. <laughs> what, what, do, what does a composer do? I mean, do you, uh, get some, you get well, some ideas and then do you put them, put them down somewhere first? Basically that's so. I, say, I suppose the composer tries to write beautiful music that everybody will love. That's one of the things. And the other thing is... You think so? Is, really? Yeah. Or that, that everyone will love? Or, well, or that, I mean, he, that you, you know, will be satisfied really, with? No, oh, really. well, I mean, you, you have to be satisfied first. Uh -huh. Otherwise, you wouldn't even think that everybody would love it if you don't love it uh -huh. <laughs> yourself at first. But um, uh, I think that perhaps too much... Um, emphasis on the inspirational side. There's a lot that goes into composing that doesn't have to do with inspiration. The technical side of uh, composing, the getting all the harmonies that make sense and the make sense when you follow one after the other, and the formal shape in music uh, of an ambitious kind, a concert piece that lasts 20 minutes for, without pausing, is very different from writing a three-minute song. They don't really compare. So that the um, the learning of your job as a composer in the serious field of music is it takes time. I studied three years with a good teacher in New York and uh, then two more years in, in Paris so that uh, you don't uh, pick it all up just like that. I know, but you still, um, all things being equal, there are, other, there are people who, can, who get their technique and who get ideas, but there must be some kind of, um, uh, whether it's called inspiration or um, Something when you say that the ideas either come or they don't come. They did then and they don't now. Um, whether you call it inspiration or spirit or uh, isn't there some kind of unexplainable uh, gift that one person has that, uh, at, at a particular time to write music? And oh, yes, I think so, sure. I mean. Everybody who wants to write music has to study, of course, and yeah. get the yeah. science, of, if it is a science, <laughs> of uh, uh, harmony and form in music and get all the basics. But the, um, the writing of a piece of music that other people will call inspired, that you can't do much about. You hope you're inspired when you write your music, but it, it, there's no guarantee that you are. Often your music is divided, which I don't agree with, into two different um, kinds of music, easy, difficult, accessible, abstract, programmatic, uh, so forth. Yes. Um, when you call a piece, you wouldn't do that, but when someone calls um, uh, Billy the Kid or a Rodeo or uh, 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 some of the music that you wrote in the late 30s and 40s, easy, accessible music, what does that mean to you in terms of um, it's, it obviously would not be that it's easier, f I'm asking you that, is it easier for you to write? Is it easier uh, in any way for the composer? Or is it just easier listening? I think it's both. I think it's easier for the composer and easier listening. After all, the, what makes it easy if it's not too complex in its actual makeup? It's easier to compose and easier to listen to if it gets very well, mere length in music can cause trouble. If you write a piece that lasts a half hour without pause, uh, people who love songs that last three minutes have difficulty hanging on there for the other 27 minutes. <laughs> they get lost <laughs> very often. Um, so that mere length in music is a rather important uh, characteristic of the work that you are writing. It's one thing to write a three minute song it's a very different thing to, for, from that to uh, writing a 30-minute uh, prelude or however you, what, however you call it. Uh, mere length, in other words, in the serious form of music, concert music, is a problem. 
to make it come out so that it makes sense to the listener, that they know whether they're at the beginning, the middle, or the end of a piece, uh, is part of the art, really, of creation. When people talk about the elements of music, form is one of them. And what you're talking about now is the formal structure, structure. the overall formal yes, structure of a piece of so. music. That is, to you, one of the, that is a very difficult thing to achieve in an abstract piece of music. True enough. Mm -hmm. So part of what might be called easier in um, uh, the ballet music and the film music, uh, mm -hmm. the fact that they are written uh, to combine with some other purpose and that somebody else supplies you uh, either with a scenario for ballet or a film uh, script, does that make it, um, you feel, I assume that that makes it easier for you to compose instead of having to work that whole formal structure out yourself? Well, it's, uh, speaking generally, yes. But it's, it's very possible that uh, you might be given the job of putting a film to music which doesn't have easy solutions uh, for, creates problems for you. It, it isn't always easy, but speaking, as I said, speaking generally, it, it, a, a music uh, written in order to go with something else tends to be easier to write than what we call absolute music. That is music meant merely to be heard without any subject matter that gives you a hint mm -hmm. as to what the composer meant. How much would a program or a commission influence you in the way the music would, uh, uh, the style of the music? Well, it would depend a lot on the um, uh, purpose for which the piece is meant to be written. That is say, if I'm asked to write, well, a, p a band piece for a high school band, mm -hmm. I wouldn't be writing the same music that I write for the Philharmonic to play in Carnegie Hall. So in that sense, of course, the, uh, the purpose of the piece, if it has one, is an important element in, in the way you uh, proceed to, to write it. But still the musical uh, content and the ideas are musical ones, not derived from the program? By and large, yes, purely musical ones. Mm -hmm. How uh, early did you have commissions for works? And I'm thinking in terms of not so much historically, but uh, whether that makes a very big difference. If you have, I know early on when things were tough and you, and that's hard for people, by, by the way, yes. <laughs> to, uh, to realize that there were hard times and that there were financially <laughs> hard times for Aaron Copeland. There were <laughs> fine, um, difficult, um, terribly difficult criticisms and um, uh, everything else. Um, early on, there weren't commissions uh, to do works. And then yeah. after that, uh, you, you almost always, always, didn't you have uh, a commission to do a work? Not always. Sometimes, uh, I don't think, in the case of the longer piano pieces that I wrote, that they were uh, anything that came except that I wanted to write a long and extended uh, piano work. But as you get better known, you find that more and more people think of you in relation to uh, commissioning a work for some special soloist or for an orchestra in their town or whatever the reason. Mm -hmm. And um, finally, with the help of our performance rights society called ASCAP, you uh, are able to really live by your compositions. But that is only possible when you have a certain amount of baggage, musical baggage. <laughs> it isn't possible to do that if you just have a small output. Well, you yourself mentioned ASCAP. I wasn't going to do that right away, but mm -hmm. you had a lot to do with ASCAP's uh, being uh, and then subsequently um, uh, it got so big and so uh, uh, successful that BMI started. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, what did you, did you have some feelings in the early days that, um, uh, that it, was, it was too hard for particularly American composers to get into um, royalties and performance rights and all of that? Well, in the early days of concert music, certainly, uh, composers weren't thinking about forming themselves into a society in order to uh, collect performance rights to their music. Mm -hmm. But the French really led the way. The French were the first uh, to organize uh, a society for, for the sole purpose of collecting the right to perform a work for profit. That's publicly for profit. That's the, um, it has to be for profit, otherwise the composer has no right to ask. Mm for any um, sum in connection with the performance. Uh, but in the early days, um, the people who formed the society in America 
uh, Society of uh, Authors, how is it, Authors, Publishers, and somebody else, um, were not thinking about the concert world. They were thinking about the commercial world of popular songs and such. It was um, difficult for us in the concert world to establish the same right, right for that kind of music that the jazz boys had already done in the popular field. But by now, it, it all functions well, and um, I think it's an essential part of our musical setup. I mean, composers have to live, and um, the principle that every time a, per, a piece of theirs is played for profit, that's the important two words for profit, they have a right to collect the performance fee. The mere fact that you own a piece by buying it in the store doesn't mean you can play it as much as you like for an audience who's paid to get in. <laughs> um, and that's been a very important source of income for our more serious composers. I know I've been through a great deal of correspondence that dates far back from places like Arrow Music and Coast Cobb Press, ah, and yes. I bet that there aren't too many people today who know no, those names, but um, uh, I know and, and you know and, and uh, uh, many others who have worked in American music that um, uh, it was pretty much um, uh, scrounging around for some way to have American American composers um, even get their works published. It's a little ironic. Um, your publisher, and there you are, the Dean of American Composers, if I may quote that oft-times used uh, title for you, with a publisher who is uh, Boozy and Hawks. A British publisher. Yes. I know sometimes I wake up and I think how odd it is that uh, no American publisher seems sufficiently interested yeah. to um, publish me. It was um, really a friend, a rather well-to-do lady friend of ours who loved music, who first set us up in a publishing uh, situation so that we could get our music published and sold and performed that through that medium. Uh, only in later years did the big, the big group, the American Society of Published Authors mm -hmm, and so forth, mm -hmm. uh, decided to include the composers of serious, so-called serious music. Was that the well-known Mrs. Alma um, Wertheim? Wertheim? Yes. 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 Um, she was a big help. I mentioned her name because sometimes there are people who are kind of behind the scenes who um, mm -hmm. did so much to help American sure music. Enough. And they're not mentioned uh, very often, but particularly because the whole aspect of uh, patron patronage and patronesses and uh, uh, for uh, composers has changed quite a bit. Was it uh, true in the early days that if, if um, somebody needed some help, why uh, it was possible that uh, you would go and play some music at someone's home and um, there might be a, a wealthy um, lady or gentleman who was interested in music and would actually support you for a year or two years or how many? That was uh, mm -hmm. fairly often uh, happened and mm -hmm. uh, it was a, a great help. I know it was to me. But later on, of course, the Guggen Foundation was founded and that helped too. The Guggenheim. The Gu uh, I meant the Guggenheim, yeah, yes. Yeah. You had the first one in music, didn't you? I think I did, yes. One of many firsts that... <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to go back a little bit to something that caught me that you said before, and if you uh, don't mind my pushing you a little on, on this. Um, you said that a uh, composer wants to uh, make his audiences happy. How important... I said that? Well, a composer likes to write. That's why I'd like to straighten it, straighten it a little bit there. How, how much, how important is the audience to, uh, it varies from composer to composer, right. of course. Uh, to you, how important has it been to satisfy um, both a wide audience and, and, your, and your musician friends and, and peers? Well, I think a lot depends on what it is you're trying to write. If you were uh, invited to come out to Hollywood and write musical, a musical score for a, a, a movie, you know that that movie will probably be seen by perhaps millions of people. Mm -hmm. It wouldn't occur to you in that case, I would think, that, that you would adopt an idiom which in advance you knew was so uh, far out, so modern, uh, that that audience couldn't possibly latch on to it. So that's, the sense of who is this the music is directed to has a, quite a lot to do with the, what the kind of music you produce. And a composer would be silly to write a highly abstract and uh, 
uh, full of, of dissonance uh, music, uh, with the, the thought that, oh, this is going to be a great hit. I mean, he knows in advance that it isn't going to be a great hit, mm -hmm. but he wants, <clears throat> he wants to write that piece, and so he'll write it if he has any sense. Um, I think most composers can pretty much guess in advance if they're open-minded, <laughs> clear-headed, uh, guess uh, the potential audience that such a piece, uh, a particular piece, would be addressed to. The, and if you write, as I say, in a highly abstruse manner with uh, difficult harmonies, not familiar ones, or if the piece is a, beyond normal length of a 10 or 20 minute piece, you know in advance that you're heading for trouble as far as having a big public love it. Well, maybe a lot of our composers then like trouble or are not <laughs> open-minded and clear-headed because you know what well, has happened. With, well, now look, I re, I, you know the famous article um, that Milton Babbitt did, Who Cares If You Listen, that has been so, so uh, mm -hmm. much quoted and, uh, and how so many of our composers have um, mm -hmm. will become either university composers who will, um, will not consider their audiences. And I suppose uh, what you're saying, that is a decision they have to make and yeah. know in advance if they do that, um, that and maybe they can accept the consequences. Yes. <laughs> That's, uh, yes, I know. Not all composers are quite that clear-headed in relation yeah. to their own creations. <laughs> well, they might be clear-headed in, uh, in uh, judging somebody else's music yeah. and as to its potential audience and the character of it, mm -hmm. the nature of it. But it's difficult to be very you know, dispassionate about the thing you yourself create and to judge in advance the extent of the audience that it might or might not attract. I remember you saying to me, uh, almost at the beginning of when we got to know each other, that was, uh, happened to be um, an interview I did with you about Charles Ives. And I remember you saying that one of the things that, that struck you so uh, as about Ives was his bravery in the fact that he, uh, how could anybody go without hearing their own music played? Yes. For so, an audience. Yes. So along with this conversation about audiences and what they do or don't mean to you or to other people, um, more specifically in a musical way, how important is it to you um, to hear that music performed um, after you write it? I mean, does it, uh, do you know in advance in your head exact, really how that is going to sound when you composed it, or do you really, do you need to have it played? Oh, I think you need to have it played. You uh, mostly think you know how it's going mm. to sound, but the real test is the sounding of it, and you have to be prepared for surprises if you have any sense. But uh, the more experience you have in listening to music you've written, played live by some group or individual, the more you're likely to be able to develop in advance a, a judgment about what you've written and what its likely uh, future is going to be. I think composers sometimes fool themselves uh, as to the potential audience they're writing for. In other words, they write a highly abstruse uh, piece of music that's difficult to understand, and then they hope that everybody's going to love it. They fool themselves that well, uh, but everybody isn't going to love it, and I think they should be uh, clear-headed as to the potential audience they're addressing due to the nature of the work they write. You've pulled off an awful lot, though, you realize, because you have satisfied um, uh, a knowing full well, and it must make you very happy to, to, to see the pleasure that your uh, kind of music that, uh, well, something like Lincoln Portrait that I know you, you told me when you came back from, from Washington, um, uh, I think it was last Decoration Day, that there were 40,000 people uh, on the lawn of the Capitol. And um, uh, so that's, that's what the newspaper said. Well, I didn't count them. I know. And I know you also <laughs> said it was free and the weather was good and you had <laughs> your kind of modesty. But uh, still, that's, that's quite. How does it feel to take a bow in front of 40,000 people? Well, it's rather dizzying, actually. <laughs> <laughs> you have been able to uh, have the pleasure of satisfying that uh, wide audience. You're Here assuming you're... they were satisfied. Well, I, I know they are. They came, that's 
<laughs> well, I mean that that audience and all the others. I'm I work on a college campus, and I know uh, I I see you in these settings, and I see many many young people all over yes. the world coming to your concerts. Yeah, that's true. But I've always been very pleased. Um, yeah, I they're know generally that. up in the gallery, but even so, yeah, I it's very know. nice that they're there. So you you have that uh, accomplishment. Um, on the other side, um, however, you didn't stay. You didn't start with that. You didn't stay with that. Uh, seems to me you um, never was satisfied to stay in one place for I mean, uh, one frame of reference. Right. I mean, if you had stayed with the jazz-oriented works uh, past the first few, uh, you knew that that you had done what you wanted to with that, and then went on to to a really very different kind of music. Now uh, that different kind of music must please you in um, a very special way. I know Bill Schumann, for example, has said, having uh, talking to him about you, uh, having the um, approval and the admiration of your composer friends and your musician uh, colleagues is the highest, is, is certainly one of the highest uh, pleasures for any composer. And I'd agree with that. Yeah. Your decision to do something like the piano variations at a time when you did, um, kind of a thorny direction to go in from uh, the jazz-oriented works. And even after the popular works, you came back to connotations and inscape and uh, mm -hmm. uh, works that um, are considered much more difficult. Is always a challenge to you to move on to some something you hadn't tried? I think every composer would want to, well, would not want to be stuck in any one style. They want to feel that they're, you know, developing and broadening their musical vision. And so you tend to look around for things that will help you do that. Sometimes you hear a piece by a fellow composer uh, and it gives you a bright idea that you wouldn't have had if you hadn't been listening to that piece. So that um, when you live in the world of music, like any musician naturally would, you're exposed to lots of different sorts of music, and naturally some of it appeals to you much more than others, and you're probably influenced by that when you write your own music. I know that when I was a young man, for instance, the music of Igor Stravinsky seemed absolutely tops to me in the contemporary field, and um, I think history has proved that it was the tops. We weren't making a mistake in having that, made that judgment. But uh, the writing of any work of art, I suppose, is a gamble. You think you know what you've done and the value of the potential value of it, but you never can be sure until it's really tested before an audience or several audiences. You mustn't judge too soon. I mean, the history of music is littered with um, great works which were not accepted by an audience, so you can't judge that all the time. But the uh, pieces sound different when they're played before an audience and when you stay home and play it for yourself at the piano. Yeah. They seem longer or shorter, uh, tougher or easier. You're, you're not sure exactly how it seems at home. You have to hear it in live performance before a live audience in order really to test its potentialities. Interesting um, that you should feel that way at, and yet I know, I think for a fact, mm -hmm. that you have rarely changed a piece of music. Uh, once it, um, once you've finished it, that's I mean, there true. are very often in orchestral, uh, uh, in performing, I've been on the stage when a, com a composer these days will do a new work and they will be right there on the spot and listening to what they've done and they will um, change this or change that or go home and mm -hmm. sure. and cut or whatever. That uh, uh, even though you really get a great great deal out of hearing it performed, you've never you re you don't change anything. Well, I think it largely depends how you write. If, like some composers, um, if you write in a sort of wild passion of so-called inspiration, uh, you generally have second thoughts about it. If you don't work that way, if you work more slowly, uh, don't finish it all right away from beginning to end and have time to go back and think about it, it seems different several days later when you hear that same music. Um, it's a little bit a matter of temperament. Com some composers have to work in that way of uh, getting it all down in one flash of uh, so-called inspiration. Others 
like to, like I, I'm the, the other type who likes to get away from what I've done mm -hmm. for a couple of days so I can judge it more uh, truly. And I know you said you're a, a work a year man, essentially, yeah. <laughs> except for some of yeah. the smaller works. True. That adds up to quite a nice, um, uh, quite a nice catalog of. Um, yeah, but uh, you have to live long enough in order to have it add up. Well, <laughs> here you are. <laughs> it doesn't happen by itself. <laughs> well, that has happened, which is wonderful. <laughs> what was called the movement uh, for modern music, something you were closely associated with, again, very often surprising to people, um, that your early years were, uh, you were called uh, a wild-eyed, uh, mm -hmm. avant-garde, experimental, innovator, and so forth. They didn't, um, uh, what I'm getting to is criticism. Didn't it bother you in those years, and does it, does it um, bother you now, or do you try to keep that historical perspective, thinking it takes a long time before anybody really knows the, uh, the value? And uh, some of those you're suggesting bothered by bad, bad write-ups, mm -hmm. severe criticism? Mm -hmm. or, oh. or bothered by criticism, how much does it mean to you uh, generally? Well, it largely depends on who's doing the criticizing. Uh, if some dumbbell in the writes on a newspaper, and you know it's, he's a dumbbell from having read him on the subject of music many times, naturally you pay no attention. If you respect the critic's uh, opinions and his musical knowledge, that's a very different thing. If he says something's too long, it's probably too long. You better think about it twice. It's not easy to judge your own music when it's fresh off the griddle, you know. Uh, it takes a lot of um, perspective and uh, calmness and <laughs> lack of personality, I mean, very personal personality, <laughs> to be able to judge it coolly as, 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 and look at it as if somebody else had written it. Not many composers can do that. But it is a good thing if you can do it because you need perspective uh, on a brand new piece and uh, uh, somebody else's mind will be able to uh, put you right as to a piece maybe too long or too short or lacking in one thing or another. It isn't always easy for the creator of a piece to be very dispassionate about the critical faculties that might go into the uh, judging of the piece. But you'd have to have quite, quite a bit of confidence in what you were doing to, uh, to do a work like the Piano Variations, for example, um, in um, 1930. True enough. Uh huh. And uh, know that uh, you 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 must you knew in advance that um, how it would be received. You mean toughly received? Yes, right. I didn't know that. In yeah. Advance. You to does it, does a composer have to be a little bit um, uh, a little bit tough and have uh, have the confidence in uh, in what he's doing? Um, very strong confidence. Oh, I think so, yes. Otherwise, you're not. If you don't really believe in what you're doing, you're going to be too easily discouraged by adverse criticism. Um, you can only do what you do if you really are thoroughly convinced about the value of what you're doing. If you begin to have your own two thoughts about it, gee, is this really as good as I thought it was, and that kind of thing, that's not healthy. It happens, mm -hmm. but it isn't healthy. <laughs> You've told me at various times that anyway, it was part of the fun uh, as a young person to yeah. know that you were um, that you were forging ahead with something new, and that yeah, it upsetting was upsetting one's elders. Yes, upsetting yes. one's elders. But then there were elders like um, who were not upset. Uh, someone like Serge Kusevitsky, uh, who, in spite of the, the the poor reviews, would say write me another piece, and I can't imitate the way he would say, write no. me another piece, beyond. I know many um, of you people who are close to Kusevitsky have a wonderful way of um, imitating, his, of English, imitating right? his English, you and Bill Schumann and Leonard Bernstein and so forth. Uh, but um, all kidding aside with him, um, it was, was it part of the, the fun of the whole, of, of all of it, to be in the forefront and uh, know that the reviews were going to be uh, call you um, uh, wild-eyed, uh, eccentric, and uh, and yet feel secure that you were forging ahead in something called modern music was a cause, wasn't yes, it? Yes, of course it was. No, I think it was part of the excitement of being a composer. Yeah. If one was writing music that everybody quietly accepted as okay, that wouldn't be much fun. But if you believe in something that you've written and others find it rather far out and sort of going a bit too far, 
then you sort of feel elated because it stirred them up in a way that isn't conventional. Virgil Thompson has uh, told me that that cause for modern music was won. Do you think it? That what was that? The cause for modern music has well, been, has been won, won, and that there there isn't uh, there isn't a modern music, so to speak, yeah. any longer. Do you agree with that? I, by and large, uh, yes. Of course, there are forms of modern music that still seem so far out that they're rather difficult to latch on to. But by and large, I don't think there's so much talk about the mere language of, of new music than there used to be 30 or 40 years ago. Mm -hmm. The audience reaction, though, to uh, whatever at any particular time is considered modern or new, do you really think, do you think there's, uh, they've been won? Uh, won over? Yeah. Well, they may have been won over 20 years after the thing has been written, but they're still very reluctant to uh, take what's written now, today, uh, with the same enthusiasm that they give to something that they can get some perspective on, even in the recent past, in terms of the recent past. Um, I don't see any reason why the really new music shouldn't be difficult to be uh, understood. It's uh, part and parcel of the whole idea of writing something new and not yet done, that it is going to be difficult to understand at first hearing. So that one really should take that into account and accept it as one of the facts of life. The newer it is, the more unconventional and the more daring, the more difficult it's going to be for a general public to uh, accept it. One of the advantages, there must be some to your to birthdays, as we all <laughs> know, and you have many. I would think one of them is um, uh, the change in the, the acceptance in, of works that were considered uh, much too difficult to either, be, to either be played or to be listened to. I think of uh, one of my favorite Copeland works, A Short Symphony. I believe that Kusevitsky, even Kusevitsky, who, who was the champion of your music, uh, gave that up as being too difficult to, mm. to perform. Sure uh, that, does that say something about um, uh, leaving audiences behind for a moment? Now, uh, performers. Um, performers now can play your... It's, it's not easy. That, uh, I, I watched you rehearsing last week, the uh, American Symphony Orchestra, mm -hmm. with the, and those, some of those uh, rhythmic changes and the uh, five fours and the rest of it is still difficult. Yeah. things to play, but does that say something for um, performers, or, uh, orchestral performers and others? Um, do you think that they're much better trained now, or they have just become used to uh, more uh, difficult rhythmic patterns and harmonic uh, I think changes? It's both. So? They've become more used to them and more able to fight with them <laughs> and put them over. There's still a lot of resistance in orchestras. Do you find that that varies? Much less than there used to be. Mm -hmm. It was very tough to write a work uh, with a lot of seven eighths and different rhythms from measure to measure and uh, make the uh, perform performing musician happy. They played it because they had to, but they didn't like the idea of uh, struggling with these unconventional rhythms. After all, all the great music of Beethoven and Bach and others, you go, you start in fourth quarter, and normally you stay yeah. within that frame of reference, mm -hmm. anyhow. Um, but gradually, the more they played, the more it began to become more conventional to mm -hmm. play seven eighths and nine sixteenths, etc., odd uh, things like that. And uh, I think by now it'd be rare to have musicians say, "Oh, I can't play this; it's too complex." It yeah. happens from time to time, but not yeah. so often as it did in the past. I know a violinist the other day said uh, that they, uh, to me that, that uh, she felt that uh, Aaron Copeland had taught orchestras how to play in 5-4 and that you must have been born in 5-4. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to um, ask you a little bit uh, about um, a subject that is often talked about in connection with, with you, and, but in perhaps a slightly different way, and that is um, uh, something called an American sound. Aside from the fact that you have given so much of your time and efforts towards, and you, you, you mentioned ASCAP, and I mentioned that you had a great deal to do with that, and publication possibilities for American composers and so forth, you don't fit the, um, the, old, the idea of, a, of an artist in isolation starving in a garret and writing uh, in an isolated uh, way. I mean, it's always, and any time I have talked to you, one of one of the expressions in, that you have is my pals. My and pal, we'd like yes. to have your pals around. Um, 
they acknowledge you as a leader in so many ways, uh, but are they important to you, too? Well, it'd be a rather lonely world if you didn't have pals, so in that sense, of course, they're important. But in our American musical scene, in the field of so-called serious music, it was very unusual to, to have the composers gang up together, so to speak, to put over their things in one form or another, in the best sense or even in the worst sense. So that the idea of um, getting the composers of serious music into a society for the publication and furthering of the live performance of their works was not, not a usual one. It was uh, connected, with, in my mind, with the earlier years of the 20th century. And I think we, we did an important uh, work in establishing the idea that composers should organize in order to get their music played and uh, collect their rights of performances in sheer money terms. Um, and I think that the American composer today is in a much more, much for, more fortunate uh, situation in that sense than was true in the past. I asked a young composer uh, recently how he felt about that in connection with you. And he said that in the past he thought it was impossible to be, uh, that it, it, uh, it was impossible to be uh, a composer, an American composer. It was almost uh, uh, something totally unheard of. But that now young composers feel that, uh, uh, albeit a very difficult time and hard time ahead of them, it's not something impossible anymore, that mm -hmm. there is such a thing as an American composer. And uh, in your early days, that was, uh, that was not, uh, almost not unheard of in the world scene, so to speak, that, a, that someone from this country could make it yeah. as a... Uh, uh, yes, we're, we're late comers at the musical right. feast in the field yeah. of more serious yeah. so-called uh, music. And uh, I think we made extraordinarily uh, fast progress considering the fact that yeah. we were off to a slow start. After all, you can't write great orchestral music if you don't have great orchestras to play it. <laughs> and that takes time, and it took a couple of hundred years for us yeah, to get yeah. that far here in our own country. You, you have had a lot to do with making that, uh, uh, the road uh, easier for American composers, but I'd like to, to stay in, in talking to you with the American situation about what is, uh, ca uh, people call the American sound uh, I don't, that's a phrase that, that you hear thrown around a bit, and mm -hmm. I'm not sure that musically uh, people think about it too uh, specifically. What, if you were to take musical elements uh, and talk about them, uh, after all, you know, you've got that, so there's, there's the raw material, and there's the sound, and there's the notes and the rest. What do you think in your music makes that come out sounding to, so that other people will, would call that American, would call your music American? Well, that's difficult to um, say in any really secure terms. I would think the first thing that might be noticed would be the rhythmic life of the music. I think mm -hmm. we've been very in, uh, influenced by our popular composers, and certainly the creation of the jazz men was very stimulating in the creation of complicated rhythms that uh, classical music didn't really work with. So that was an important influence. Um, it's difficult to pin down. There are so many different composers doing different things. It's difficult to add it all up and get a, a logical and uh, satisfying result. Mm -hmm. uh, I like the fact that a lot of things are going on. That a lot of different composers are writing in a different, different way, one from the other. And that um, we mustn't decide too soon what the American sound is, because then we'll be stuck with it. Uh, French music took a long time, right. I think, to discover its true nature, and um, it, it, we shouldn't be in a rush to get there. <laughs> well, you know, you're always uh, treading on difficult ground unless you're just throwing around generalities to talk about uh, national nationalism and, and that those kind of qualities in music. It seems to me that if you think about uh, Debussy and French music, it was his music first. Um, and then it became uh, it, it identified in people's minds as French-sounding music. Sure and enough. to me, at least, that's what's happened with, uh, with Aaron Copland's music. It's your music first and your sound, your personal stamp on that music, uh, and then that becomes, call, becomes identified as American sound. At least it, it seems, uh, seems that way to me.
Well, that's very satisfying, of course, for me, <laughs> since I... <laughs> you see, I spent three years in Paris as a music student, and I was very aware of the Frenchness of French music, yeah. the music, of, for instance, of Debussy and Ravel, uh, when compared with Wagner and the other German composers. It seemed very different indeed in character and sound, and um, I thought, well, gee, in America we've developed a, f a school, you might call them, of uh, composers of light music, popular music, ragtime and jazz later, uh, that everybody identifies as American. Why can't we do that in the field of uh, concert music, or so-called serious music? And that became one of my preoccupations when I was in my 20s and 30s. Later on, when you've done it to your own satisfaction anyhow, it doesn't seem so important to keep on doing your, your major point. And um, you, you have to be happy with it as far as it goes. Well, somehow you've managed to do it in a style where uh, kind of uh, trying to teach people a lesson, and yet it doesn't seem like swallowing bad medicine, and that's a, a hard <laughs> trick to pull off. So <laughs> I admire that you have been able to do that. You like you have you like to write, uh, at least you did in your uh, from very early on. I I remember an article. Um, you did as early as 1925 in Musical America uh, about You're making me feel very old, but go on. <laughs> what it means, <laughs> what it means to be an American composer and study abroad, and that as and as early as 1925, also you were writing. If I remember, for uh, modern music, you did an article on George Antile, the bad boy of uh, music, yes, yes. and uh, somebody who was very well known for a while and has yeah, not heard of. They had a big noise then, yes. Georgie. Yeah, I, I mentioned that, but the writing, um, after you have four books, and one of them translated into, I counted them up, ten languages, Arabic ten. and Persian included. Wow. <laughs> and German, and I got a big kick one day out of you telling me, imagine, and the, the title of the work is, uh, that one is, What to Listen for in Music. I remember you telling me that was a great pleasure to be able to have that, the German translation. Of yes. Yes. To tell the Germans how to listen to music seemed like a cute idea. <laughs> After all the years they were telling us what music was like. Yeah. That was part of the development of your musical life, wasn't it? The uh, kind of a, 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 a conscious veering away from German uh, Teutonic influences that had been so much part of, our, of, the, of music. True. I think one of the reasons for that was that I spent those three years in the early 20s in Paris, mm -hmm. and the Frenchness of French music was so marked by comparison with the German of, mm -hmm. Germanness of German music that I thought, well, if the French can do it, why can't we do it? We have American popular music that the whole world recognizes as American. Mm -hmm. Why can't we do it in the field of symphonic and concert music? Mm -hmm. So that, I kept thinking about that for about 10 or 20 years. And of course, once I did it to my own satisfaction, it didn't seem so important to just go on doing that particular thing. Yeah. So it was less preoccupying. Can you imagine that we have talked this long and uh, we have not uh, mentioned uh, Mademoiselle Boulanger? Isn't that oh, extraordinary? It seems rather <laughs> surprising, yes. And usually um, she comes very much into conversation, and rightfully. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was very happy to meet her. Finally, I think it was right before her 90th birthday, mm. and I remember when I asked her about you, she said, ah, Copeland, <laughs> <laughs> and proceeded then to tell me about uh, uh, what she thought of you. Mm -hmm. um, and I wouldn't mention it except, of course, it was all good. <laughs> For many years, so many people have talked about the uh, boulangerie and the yes. people, uh, the, the effect on, uh, wasn't it Virgil Thompson who said that every small town, every town in the United States had a five and ten cent store and a boulanger student? <laughs> yes, it was. And that, I think, had a lot to do with you. Didn't you send people to her as time Not went sure, on? Yes. Right. I bring that up because although we're not doing a history of Aaron Copeland today, would be a little uh, extensive, even though we do have a nice amount of time. Uh, in terms of teaching, that I know what her teaching meant to you, uh, aside from the technical things, which are so extraordinary, mm -hmm. her, her uh, knowledge of music past and present, but her openness and her uh, uh, involvement with you and each person if, if they were, if they themselves were talented and involved in their music. Um, in, term, in terms of your own teaching, 
you never wanted to have a, a, a steady teaching place, did you? Have you ever wanted? Well, no, I, I never had a burning desire to pass on to the young whatever it was I knew. Um, but it is a way of making a living, of course, when you're <laughs> not one known as a composer and can't and haven't written enough so that you can hope to uh, live from the earnings of your music. And it's better than taking a job as a bank cashier. <laughs> But you make it sound like not such a great thing to do. I mean, you, you mean those times you were teaching at the new school? Yes. Well, that was different. That was not so much teaching as giving public lectures to an audience on how to listen to music. Or why, By the way, that's, I that it. became the book, What to Listen for yes, Music, if did. I'm not mistaken. Uh, what to Listen for yeah. in Music, I called the lectures. And then uh, I was lucky enough to some fellow have, coming up to me after one of my talks and saying, Mr. Copeland, I don't know if you know it or not, but you're talking a book. I said, how do you know? He said, well, I'm an agent of McGraw-Hill Book Company, and I know a book when I hear one. <laughs> so he said, I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll uh, send a, a man down here with tape machine, and uh, he'll take down verbatim what you say, and you'll see whether you're, I'm right or not. And he did that, and after about 11 or 12 weeks, I used to give one lecture a week. By golly, he practically handed me my book, What to Listen For in Music, which was the subject matter of those talks. Gosh, you make it sound awfully easy. I, I don't think it could, could have been quite that. Um, well, I've I seen your lecture notes for those, for those courses, <laughs> and they, uh, they show an awful lot of, of uh, study and work and yes. preparation. Right? I catch you on that because one of the, <clears throat> one of the phrases that I, I find you saying often that uh, other people do too is, is uh, that you're awfully lucky. I'm a lucky fellow. And I guess you are a lucky fellow, but um, <laughs> a lot of the things that happen with you that you, you say, well, I was just lucky, I happened to be, I just happened to be... 20 wanting in the 20s. To, yes, I just <laughs> happened to be wanting to go to Paris and the uh, Fontainebleau School had their first, and I just happened to be around when the first Guggenheim came yeah. along. <laughs> and uh, true, or there must be some element of the right man in the right place at the right time. But a lot of hard work. I mean, that that uh, that book did not get to be the way it was without all those preparations. Lots to listen for. In yes. The music book. Yeah. Yeah. We were talking about before that and uh, led into that uh, uh, teaching. Um, it's an interesting thing that you have had um, the most uh, you're the most well known American composer. You're the most. Uh, written about, talked You're about, about everything. about George Gershwin. No, I'm talking about Aaron Copeland. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not talking about George Gershwin. <laughs> but, but that there is not a school of, um, of students who write like Aaron Copeland. That doesn't bother you, does it? Heavens no. Why would they write like me and be able to do their own thing? I want them to do their own thing, of course.